Love may be frightening. You will eventually lose everyone you love, no matter who they are. You will lose more the more you love them. Many of us are unwilling to take the chance since loving can hurt so much. I didn't have romantic intentions when I first met Shane McGon. That was the last thing I thought of. In 1982, when I was 16 years old, my idols were music and style. I was earning a living by purchasing stylish clothing from London's Brick Lane and Portobello Road to sell at my vintage clothing store, which I had started in my hometown of Cork, Ireland. As a new romantic, my goal was to live in a world of cocktail bars, lace gloves, and cigarette holders. The 1980s Ireland was the antithesis of a wham. Video. It was gloom, depression, destitution, and emigration. I was enamored with London and her boundless capacity for glitz and frills. On the evening of December 14, my friend Joe and I were sitting at our local restaurant, the Royal Oak, in Temple Fortune, which is located in the northern part of the sea. I was wearing Joe's skin-tight tread spanned X mini dress with fishnet stockings and stilettos, feeling quite good about myself despite the quiet night and lackluster clientele. Shane entered the room with Spider Stacy from the Pogues as the door opened. Immediately, the two of them were different from everyone else in the room. They had a pop star appearance and a pop star vibe. Shane's glowing eyes and radiant face got my attention right once. He exuded Karim. Tall and very pale, he wore a black suit, a crombie overcoat, and a cap like a dapper old man. He noticed that I was staring at him and came over to our table. He declared, it's Spider's birthday. Get him a drink. I just said, F asterisk 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 off, without giving it a second thought. After Shane let out a laugh, they headed into the bar together. I spent the entire evening gazing at him. It came out that Joe had previously met Spider, who lived next door to the pub, and that they had recently formed a band called Pogue Man, which is Irish for Kiss My Ass. Somehow, a few days later, I found myself on a date with Spider at a Pogues show. He'd had a few beers before the band took the stage, and he appeared to be dozing off at the table. Shane approached us. You really ought to wake him up. He belongs on stage, he exclaimed. I was on the verge of disbelief when they finally took the stage. They sounded more like the Sex Pistols than the Clancy Brothers, playing traditional Irish music with new lyrics. Seeing the Pope break dance was akin to that. They all appeared to be English, so I wasn't sure if I should take offense, but the mood and energy were incredible. They horribly sexified Irish traditional muin. Everything about it, but especially Shane, blew my mind. He embodied everything I wanted to be. He was full of energy, enthusiasm, and passion. He could use words and voice to convey any feeling, even sadness and rage. I was enmeshed in my own self-consciousness at the time, living in constant fear of being rejected and judged. To avoid the embarrassment of being who I am, I desired to be better than everyone else. But Shane was incredibly motivating, especially to an Irish person like me, because he was brilliantly, shamelessly real and daring to be himself. Before we had a kiss, over three years had passed. A friend of his told me on my 20th birthday in January 1986, it's Victoria's birthday, you should kiss her. And he carried it out. After I gave him a ride home with my mother, who was here at the time, and I tried to catch him on camera, he instructed me to keep it clean. I went on a date to his flat in King's Cross a few days later. His room was filled with books, records, empty bottles, burger wrappers, and an extremely proud cocktail bar in the shape of a ship. He was pleased of the red walls and the red nylon sheets covering his mattress on the floor. I was sitting on the bed and he was sitting on the other side of the room, pouring me Greek wine in a mug. While chain smoking, we discussed John Coltrane, Van Morrison, Irish poetry, and tarot cards. He asked to sit next to me when it got light outside. I took hold of him and dragged him into bed. In my entire life, I had never felt more at home. It was lovely even to smell like burger wrappers and ash from cigarettes. A short while after, he confessed his love to me, and I thought there was nothing left in life to be desired. I'd struck gold. Our love seemed to be sufficient for anything. However, the bliss was short-lived. The Pogues achieved fame after their hit song Fairy Tale of New York and Shane started to unravel. He started drinking and doing drugs, not just for enjoyment, 
but also for survival, since he felt that the pressure to perform, tour, and not disappoint people was too much to bear. Every night, he required more and more just to finish a gig, and he never left the house without a bag of alcohol. People praised him for it, it got ingrained in his persona, and they started to anticipate it for him. He gained notoriety as a hellraiser, appeared on magazine covers, led the band on U.S. tours, and received excellent reviews. Superstars began showing up to their events. At one of the shows, David Bowie was seated next to me, and Faden Away and Robert De Niro came backstage to greet the band. My goal of dressing glitzy and hanging out with music stars had come true. Shane's goal of popularizing and modernizing Irish music had been accomplished. However, he hated elitism, was uninterested in glitter or renown, and refused to wear velvet robes. He enjoyed strolling into the sleazy areas of the city, talking to the homeless, and drinking at shady bars. Consequently, we both felt awful. He was scared and nervous and couldn't sleep. I lacked self-belief, steadiness, and a sense of diarrhea. Although Shane was itching to leave the band, he didn't want to disappoint anyone. He was using drugs of all types rather quickly. He then looked into hallucination. This was the period when he penned some of his most exquisite songs, yet it scared me. He was scheduled to tour with Bob Dylan, but instead he was eating a Beach Boys record at home, ranting about a summit meeting he was having with the heads of state of the world powers and proving the inferiority of the United States with blood flowing out of his mouth. I once discovered him talking to Freddy Krueger in the edit. Another time, he spent the entire day trapped in the restroom, conversing with the deceased poet James Clarence Mangan and penning a poem that the poet had dictated. Taking care of Shane became my full-time job. However, despite the fact that I traveled far with the band, I held no official position. I never felt like I had the choice to choose to have my own hotel room if I didn't want to spend the entire night smoking and watching TV because I wasn't a pop manager or crew member. I felt like I was going crazy sometimes. Actually, I had to force myself to look for ways to save myself because I felt like I was going insane. I started practicing yoga, Reiki, energy healing, and meditation. I discovered that I could experience absolute happiness and unconditional love when I meditated, and that sensation provided me with a place to stay. Because of his extreme drinking and drug addiction, Shane was fired from the Pogues in 1991. Even though he had hepatitis at the time and was unable to move, he felt a great feeling of relief. In 1993, Johnny Depp saved our bacon by inviting Shane to establish his Viper Room Club in Los Angeles. Together, they worked on Shane's new album, The Snake, as well as the music video for That Woman's Got Me Drinking. Even though things were still crazy, Shane was feeling more liberated, and we were having a lot more fun. We used to enjoy meditation together and would write and listen to music for days on end. Shane devoted a lot of his time to painting, drawing, and performing with various artists such as Nick Cave and Sunny Dokan. However, I was experiencing severe depression along with overwhelming thoughts of hopelessness and failure regarding my own word. We wound up in the Priory together in the early 2000s, me for depression, he for a den. I had to move in with my sister after we were released in an effort to attempt and establish a life and identity of my own. I started talking to angels at this point, asking them to assist me, lead me in a more constructive path, and provide me with some answers. They began teaching me how to transform the energy I was releasing, and how to feel the love and strength that were within me. I started to channel angels for other people, and recorded their talks with me in a book. I felt some affection for myself, and that I had something worthwhile to offer the world for the first time. As my angelic connection deepened, I painted them, created angel scarves, and imparted angel communication skills to others. Soon later, in 2002, Shane and I reconciled, and in 2018 we tied the knot in Copenhagen. Shane broke his pelvis in 2015, but despite this, the last few years of our life together were the happiest and most blissful. We discovered a profound sense of gratitude for simply existing together, exchanging words and gazing into each other's eyes. Just being together brought us millions of moments of unbridled happiness, and we never questioned our love for one another. 
I have never experienced love like the one I have and still feel for him. Neither of us fought Shane would not make a full recovery after being hospitalized in Dublin earlier this year for viral encephalitis. Instead, we always anticipated he would live to be at least 80 years old. It's obviously different for everyone, so I'm not sure if it's better to be ready for death, but it certainly came as a huge shock to me when he passed away on November 30 at 3.30 am. Thankfully, he appeared really calm, and the hospital room exudes grace right away. At the moment of his death, thousands of angels surrounded him, and they radiated love and serenity over us all. He truly passed away during the final ceremonies, which was incredibly consoling because he was a devout follower of his religion who regularly received Holy Communion and prayed. Sincerely, I can't recall Shane's final words, but I believe he said thank you. He expressed his gratitude. The nurses actually made a statement about how frequently he thanked him. His ability to be thankful for the little things in life was well known to everyone who knew him, and he expressed his gratitude for life every morning. He was grateful for everything in his life as well as for everyone he encountered. Nick Cave and Johnny Depp were among the many persons he had a connection with during his life who attended his funeral in County Tipperary in what was, without a doubt, the most peculiar and magical event I had ever witnessed. Thousands more people lined the streets. It demonstrated Shane's ability to win people over, and it could have been directed by Martin Scorsese. It was deeply touching to see the outpouring of love for him from so many people across so many nations and from such a diverse range of background. I can see why falling in love might be scary for some people, since the feeling is so wonderful that you don't want it to end. While I am aware that everyone must eventually pass away, I also believe that everyone has the capacity to love, and that love never truly died. In the end, love is the only thing that truly and enduringly has value. It is the power that forms and binds us together. I will always be appreciative to Shane for bestowing this gift upon me.